Well, hello there, Mission Springers. I'm David Nystrom. Uh, I'm a professor at Western Seminary in Northern California, but I've been um, connected with the covenant all my life. I grew up at Peninsula Covenant. My mom and dad were charter members of Peninsula Covenant, and all my grandparents were part of uh, the Covenant Church in Sweden a long time ago. And uh, I'm uh, always happy to be in Mission Springs, great memories there. And we are unable, of course, to uh, have family camp together, but um, want to uh, stay connected as best we can. And so I I've been asked to um, offer some reflections, I suppose. On, uh, on the situation we're in, and, and uh, a, a rather remarkable uh, episode in our national history. I myself can't recall any time quite like this. And I was asked to um, uh, offer some reflections on, on uh, matters related to um, to suffering, to difficulty, through uh, you know, so, sort of like um, the children of Israel uh, starting out, uh, leaving Egypt and, and about to embark on a, a journey through the wilderness and not really knowing uh, what's ahead and recognizing that it's uh, probably gonna involve some, uh, some difficulty, some uh, level of suffering. So, uh, I'm going to uh, offer uh, a series of reflections, biblical reflections on suffering. So here goes. And as I record this, uh, it is uh, a little under a week from when uh, our time together was about to start. So I'd like to uh, spend some time thinking with you, reflecting with you on um, suffering and three, bo three uh, broad categories, um, the cause and point of suffering, at least from a biblical perspective, uh, the extent of evil, and uh, and then the question of of discipleship. So um, in this first category, you might call the cause and uh, the point of suffering. So what is the point of suffering and the cause of it? Well, the Bible offers um, several answers, uh, responses to the question, um, why is there suffering? Uh, why does it happen to us? And the first, I think, would be um, that suffering just so happens to be a normal component of the human condition. So think of Acts 9, 15 through 16. Now this is, um, you know, Paul uh, at this point <clears throat> has uh, had the vision uh, of the risen Christ. He is uh, been blinded and he is um, on the way, or at least uh, had maybe even has arrived or is about to arrive in Damascus. And God uh, speaks to Ananias. And the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man, that is uh, Saul, Paul, is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. I'm not sure that any of us would uh, be really excited about a job description um, uh, that included this uh, reflection, this disclosure about the nature of the job uh, at the front end. Um, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. 
I think we'd rather have how much um, he's going to enjoy working for my name or uh, how much blessing I'm going to bestow on him. Um, but no, it's I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, um, makes the case that Jesus is the Messiah precisely because he suffered, not in spite of it. Um, the nature of Jesus' mission in this world, in the context of our world, of, uh, of human uh, culture, and uh, human enterprise is that he is going to suffer and he he does this knowingly you know at the baptism the voice from heaven the bat kol god's voice uh combines two old testament passages um this is my son or you are my son now that's a quote from psalm 2 which uh, it was a royal coronation psalm, so that when uh, the king begins his reign, uh, God says, uh, from now on, you're not your own. You're my agent. You are my son. Uh, and it's your task, your job, uh, your responsibility as king uh, to uh, operate within the compass of my will and my desire. You are my agent. But then the voice from heaven um, doesn't continue, Psalm 2, because Psalm 2 says, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. Uh, but the voice from heaven says, you are my son, that's Psalm 2, and then uh, in whom I well pleased. Now that is a reference to Isaiah and to the suffering servant passage. So the voice from heaven at the baptism of Jesus combines two ideas that had never been uh, combined before in Judaism. One, uh, the agent, the delegate of God, whom we would call the Messiah, uh, and two, um, suffering. So, um, the first is, uh, is the role, and the second is how one goes about the role. Now, um, years ago, I was hired at North Park uh, as a professor. I moved to Chicago. Christine and I moved to Chicago. And, uh, you know, I had an office, and I had business cards, and I was uh, assigned certain classes. Um, so I was a, you know, I'm a professor. And, uh, but no one said, this is how you go about doing it. So I could have walked in the room the very first day and said, um, good morning class, um, I'm Dr. David Nystrom, and uh, from now on, you will refer to me only and exclusively as um, the uh, Reverend Dr. David Nystrom, blessed be your name. Now, I, I, I could have said that, I, I didn't say that, but I could have said that. That would have been one way to live out what it means to be a professor. Um, in effect, I said, uh, I'm Professor Nystrom, uh, but my name is Dave, and, and, uh, and you can call me that. Now, that's a very different way to live it out. So one is the, one is the office, the office of Messiah, um, the task of Messiah, and the second is, is how you're going to accomplish it. And, uh, and Jesus knows, the voice from heaven discloses it, that the way you're going to accomplish it is by taking on the role of suffering servant. And the, um, the temptations function within the Gospels uh, in such a way that they are there to demonstrate that Jesus has, A, understood that commission, and B, he has accepted that commission. So the temptations, stones to bread, will you use your power for yourself? Um, and he will not. He will not use his power to save himself. Um, and in fact, he uses his power to uh, disclose God's will. Um, now, you might think uh, if, if the point was just to, uh, to draw attention to himself, then the kinds of miracles he would do, well, you know, probably he ought to juggle the pyramids or, uh, you know, snap his fingers and have the whole Mediterranean Sea, uh, you know, be emptied and then snap his fingers again and, and uh, 
and, uh, the, and the water is back in the Mediterranean. His goal isn't, his purpose isn't to demonstrate his power. His, dem his purpose, in part, is to demonstrate the character of God and the mission of God. Um, and so, uh, as he says in John's Gospel, I do only, I mean, in, in John's Gospel, I do only what I see the Father doing. So Jesus is the Messiah in Mark precisely because he suffered, not in spite of it. And this very same Jesus said, uh, uh, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So the path of following Jesus is going to involve suffering. After all, opposition to the gospel is the way the world works. And this denial of self is a, is a denial of this thing within each one of us, this, um, um, this uh, incredible um, self-absorption. Luther said, we are curved in upon ourselves. Um, we have that, uh, this sort of spasmodic selfishness that's a part of what it means to be human. It's not all of what it means. Human beings are capable of tremendous kindness and good. Uh, but there is this, um, this power within us, this bent towards selfishness, toward evil, toward um, self-interest. And that needs to be brought to heal. And suffering is uh, one of the ways in which uh, that feature of our, of our being is illustrated, it's made known, it's made obvious and, uh, to us, and that um, we recognize that it needs, to be, um, it needs to be dealt with. Now, secondly, um, sometimes suffering happens because God needs to get our attention. So from Judges. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance, at Timnath Haresh, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. Uh, now, after that, a whole generation had been gathered to their fathers. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger. And because they forsook him and served Baal in the Ashtarets, because they fors uh, forsook him and served Baal in the Ashtarets, in his anger, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. And, uh, and that, uh, being knocked about of it, uh, they woke up and said, oh my goodness, uh, we have totally, um, we've totally forgotten who we are. We've totally forgotten what we're for. Uh, and so sometimes we need to hit rock bottom, right? Uh, this is the story of Pharaoh. Um, you know, it was hard. It, the Lord hardened his heart because Pharaoh already had a hard heart. And so for Pharaoh to see the truth, sometimes uh, people, have to, people have to get to rock bottom before their eyes are opened. So sometimes God needs to get our attention. But the Bible recognizes that sometimes we suffer because uh, of the actions of others. We are, each one of us, in a web of relationships. And think about the decisions of others. The sin of Adam and Eve has effects that shape the lives of every one of us. In the same way that innocent drivers suffer injury as a result of the decisions of others. This is related to the fourth, and that is, we're residents of a world gone awry. And there is a, a non-rational force of chaos in our world. So Luke 13. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too, you too will all perish. Um, similar to the story, you know, of, the, of those who died when the pool of 
of uh, Salome uh, had fallen upon them. Um, so we may be innocent bystanders, but there is a force of, of chaos, of destruction, of decay in our world. And sometimes it's accelerated by the actions of others. The great Thucydides noted this, that we are prey to the selfishness of others. Um, but that selfishness of others is, is related to, somewhat distinct, but still related to this non-rational force of chaos in our world. Sometimes uh, it's because God is working on us. This is a fascinating passage. Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 um, claims, notes, um, because he's talking about himself, um, that he knows a guy uh, you know, who has had visions from God beyond anything the rest of his, his readers and his, uh, his hearers had ever experienced. And he talks about it uh, in, a, in, a, in an elliptical way at first, like he's referring to himself, but he, he doesn't reveal that at first in this discussion. But then in verse seven, he says, but to keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, what's so fascinating here is, is he's writing now as the person who's been humbled. He's writing now. He says, he says in effect, at the beginning of this passage, uh, I'm, I'm pretty self-satisfied. I've got a, I'm pretty impressed with myself. I've got a, I have a pretty, pretty big head. Um, but God wanted to keep me from being conceited. And to keep me from being overly conceited, um, he gave me this thorn in the flesh. Now, he starts all this by talking about these great revelations he's had. <laughs> uh, um, and so it is the uh, not fully conceited Paul who's boasting about the fact that he's had revelations beyond any that uh, his readers or his hearers ever had. Um, that just strikes me as kind of, as kind of funny. But the point here is um, sometimes uh, God sends suffering. Sometimes he allows suffering uh, for his greater purpose. And in here, God is playing Satan for a sap. Satan thinks he's winning a marginal victory by uh, disturbing Paul, by giving him some physical ailment. Uh, but God is actually using it uh, for his purpose. So there's something here about the power of God. God can make, can, can draw good uh, even out of what we consider evil. And finally, um, it, it's just a mystery. Intriguing passage. Challenging passage, John 9, where uh, Jesus and his disciples are walking along and they see a man born by, blind, blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They clearly uh, expect, can conceive, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, a moral system in the world where um, uh, evil doesn't come as a result of some error, some sin, somewhere. But Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happens so the work of God might be displayed in his life. This suggests, opens a window, onto the idea um, that what we consider evil or suffering uh, isn't necessarily the same as what God considers. God thinks of ultimate purposes. We have a hard time um, getting beyond our present situation. So out of all of this, God can and will forge something good. So. Another conclusion here is God is not the author of all of our suffering. Sometimes we're the authors of our own suffering, the yetzer hara, this, this, this uh, selfish inclination within us. This is Paul in Romans 7, that which I don't want to do, I end up doing. And I'm watching myself doing it. And I'm saying to myself, don't do that, don't do that. But I watch myself do it. That's this, this evil inclination, this, um, uh, this 
selfish uh, interest is the, the gravitational pull of which we can't really escape. Now, Paul also says that within this is a yetzer hato, a good inclination. We have these two. Yes, and there is sometimes a greater purpose. You know, Job suffers and God says, um, you're questioning me? Remember your place, dude, um, and that you can trust in me. And then there's also this question of what we might call the extent of evil or a re-evaluation of evil. So what is the locus of the good? What is the location of the good? We tend to assume or even presume that we get to define the good. This is even true um, when we pray sometimes. When we pray, Lord, um, give me patience. Lord, give me mercy. Lord, give me some good thing. Which is actually kind of astonishing when you think about it, that um, you know, we're praying for something good, but we are telling God uh, <laughs> what good thing we want. Um, it, it'd be a little like going you know, to the... Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, to the spiritual maturity golden corral and uh, telling the server behind the counter, you know, I want the macaroni and I, I don't want the broccoli, uh, but I want the macaroni and the jello. Um, we tend to just to assume or even presume that we get to define the good. Our notions of evil have to do generally with what is of benefit for us. And we tend to assume the good is what is pleasurable to us or what in our view is beneficial. But the Bible defines it differently. The Bible, Romans 8, 28, says that what is good is that we are transformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So remember that God knows better than us. It may seem good to us to eat candy and fatty foods, but it's not. I like to eat ice cream for breakfast. My, the, the, the whole of my senior year of college, I ate ice cream for breakfast every single day. Probably not the smartest thing I could have done. There's also the long arc of not only our life, but, but the life on this earth, but our, 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 uh, our eternal life. You know, the, the dentist drill hurts, but it's better for us in the long run. So the Bible wants us to consider life subspecie eternitatis, that is in light of eternity. So Paul says, I consider my present sufferings nothing compared to future glory. And then there's this notion of the extent of evil. Maybe that's not the right way to frame it, um, but I think you'll cap, you'll 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 get what I'm uh, that to which I'm I'm pointing. You know, the rain that spoils our picnic may be exactly what the farmer needs. And once again, this story of the man born blind. So, um, guess what? Um, the universe really isn't all about, about us. And that's difficult for us because we live in a culture that has for the last uh, 40, 50, 60 years uh, begun more assertively to communicate to us that, um, that we deserve what we want. Several years ago, I needed to get a new phone. I went to the mall and to the Verizon kiosk. And there was a young man there with hair I did not understand. And as I walked up to the kiosk, I, 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 didn't, I hadn't even said anything yet when he looked at me and said, um, uh, I know what you want. Uh, this is what you want. And he showed me a phone and he told me how fast it was and how uh, extraordinary it was and all the things it would do. Um, and I said, uh, you know, I don't want fast. And he said, what do you mean you don't want fast? Of course you want fast. Everybody wants fast. And I said, no, well, I really, I really don't. And he said, uh, and he leaned forward and said, listen, not only do you want fast, you deserve it. And I said, 
you have you don't know me at all how could you possibly how could you possibly know what i deserve now um of course uh suffering as an element of the human experience um is one is one uh component of a much larger whole and this larger whole is uh, what Jesus calls discipleship. And discipleship itself is part of an even larger whole. Uh, three great themes. Um, three great themes uh, dominate. Um, the teaching of Jesus. One of them is um, son of man. That's his uh, favorite self-designation, son of man. Um, the second is uh, kingdom of God. Um, that is uh, wherever God's will is understood and obeyed. Um, and as son of man, Jesus is the one who brings the kingdom of God. And then discipleship is uh, what it takes, what is necessary for us to become uh, citizens, true citizens of the kingdom of God. So we'll be focusing uh, in the next video on, uh, on the nature of discipleship. What exactly is this call that Jesus uh, uh, places before us? What exactly is the road that he's inviting us to, uh, to tread? Uh, along with our sisters and brothers. That will be uh, the next video presentation.